Leonis told his steward Focus to take great care of Kalerho, and himself set out for Miletus before dawn. He was eager to bring his master the good news about the gift he had just bought that would help a great deal, he thought, in consoling his grief. He found Dionysus still in bed. He was out of his mind with grief, and for the most part even refused to go out, although he was sorely missed by Miletus. He kept to his room as if he still had a wife, had his wife with him. When he saw Leonis, he said to him, This is the first good night's sleep I have had since my poor wife died. I dreamed about her. In fact, she was taller and more beautiful. I saw her there beside me as clearly as if I were awake. In my dream, it was the first day of our married life. I was bringing her home after our wedding from my estate by the sea, and you were singing the wedding song. Leonis cried out before his master had even finished, You're a lucky man, sir, asleep and awake. You're just going to hear the very thing you've dreamed about. And he began his report. I was approached by a trader who had a very beautiful woman for sale. He had anchored outside the town to avoid customs officers, and near your country side and near your country house. I made an arrangement with him and went out to the estate. There we agreed on terms and concluded the sale for practical purposes. I've given him a talent, and he has handed the woman over to me. But the sale has to be legally registered here in town. Dionysus was glad to learn that the woman was beautiful. He was deeply attached to women, but not glad to learn she was a slave, for he was a true aristocrat, preeminent in rank and in culture throughout Ionia, and would not contemplate taking a slave as concubine. Leonis, he said, a person not freeborn cannot be beautiful. Don't you know that the poets say beautiful people are the children of gods? All the more reason for their human parents to be bor nobly born. You are struck by her because there was nobody else there. You compared her with peasant women, but you've brought, bought her. So go to the marketplace and Adrastus will see to the registration. He's a very experienced lawyer. Leonis was glad to be disbelieved. The surprise would have all the greater effect on his master. But when he went round all the harbors of Miletus and all the bankers' tables and the whole town, he could not find the Ron anywhere. He asked shopkeepers and ferrymen, but no one knew him. Well, he had no idea what to do. He got a boat and rowed along the shore to the beach, and then went to the country house. But he was not likely to find a man who was out at sea by then. So he went back to his master, reluctantly and slowly. When Dionysus saw him looking gloomy, he asked what was wrong. Sir, I've lost you a talent, he replied, that will make you more careful in, the fut in future. But what happened? The woman you've just bought hasn't run away, has she? She hasn't, but the man who sold her to me has, said Leonis. Then he must have stolen her. It's somebody else's slave he sold you. That's why he did it in a lonely spot. Where did he say the girl was from? Sybaris, in Italy. He said her mistress sold her because he, she was jealous of her. Find out if there are any Sybarites living here, and leave the woman where she is for the moment. So Leonis then went off very unhappy. His business deal had turned out unsuccessfully. He began to watch for a chance to persuade his master to visit his estate. The only hope Leonis had left was for him to see the woman. As for Callerho, the woman, countrywoman came to see her and at once they began to make up to her as if she were their mistress. The steward's wife, Plangon, quite an experienced creature, said to her, My child, you're bound to miss your own people, of course, but you should think of people here as yours as well. Our master Dionysus, you know, is a good man and kind. You are lucky the god has brought you to a good, good man, or good home. It will be like living in your own land. Come on, then. You've had a long journey. 
Wash off the dirt, you have servants. Kellerho was reluctant, but Plangon finally managed to get her to the bath. They went in, rubbed her with oil, and wiped it off carefully. When she undressed, they were even more awestruck. Indeed, although when she was clothed, they admired her face as divinely beautiful, when they saw what her clothes covered, her face quite went quite out of their thoughts. Her skin gleamed white, sparkling just like some shining substance. Her flesh was so soft that you were afraid even the touch of a finger would cause a bad wound. The women murmured to one another, Our mistress was beautiful and celebrated for it, but she would have looked like this woman's servant. Kellerho was distressed by their praise. It was ominous. When she had her bath and they were arranging her hair, they brought her clean clothes. But Kellerho said they were not suitable for a woman who had just been bought as a slave. Give me a slave's tunic. Why, you are superior to me. So she put on ordinary clothes, but even they suited her well and looked expensive with her beauty shining on them. When the women had eaten, Plangon said, Go to Aphrodite's shrine and pray. She appears in these parts, and not only the people round here, but folk from town come and make sacrifice to her. She listens particularly to Dionysus' prayers. He never passes her shrine without stopping. Then they told her about the goddess's appearances. One of the countrywomen said, Lady, when you look at Aphrodite, you'll think you're looking at a picture of yourself. When Kalerho heard this, she burst into tears and said to herself, This is disastrous. Even here it is the goddess Aphrodite who is the cause of all my troubles. But I will go. I have a lot I want to reproach her for. The shrine was near Dionysus' house, just by the main road. Kalerho kneeled in front of Aphrodite and embraced her feet. You were the first to show Karias to me she said. You made a handsome court couple of us, but you have not watched over us, and yet we paid you honor. But since that was your will, I ask one thing of you. Grant that I attract no man after Charius. Aphrodite refused her prayer. After all, she is the mother of Eros, and she was now planning another marriage, which she did not intend to preserve either. Kalerho, delivered from pirates and the sea, was regaining the beauty that was really hers. The peasants were awestruck to see her looking lovelier every day.